Welcome to the AI and Big Data and Finance webinar. We are delighted to have two distinguished speakers today. Stefano Giglio from Yale University. He will talk about his work on biodiversity risk. Caroline Flammer from Columbia will be the discussant. As usual, we will have 30 minutes for the presentation by Stefano. Um, if there are clarifying questions, please put them into the Q&A. I will briefly interrupt Stefano after around 50 minutes to answer those questions. Caroline has 20 minutes for her discussion. Afterwards, we will open the floor for questions from the audience. As audience, please submit your questions into the Q&A. I will then call on you during the questioning part. And as a reminder, please be respectful with your comments. The presentation and the discussion will be recorded and together with the slides will be posted on our website. After the main part of the webinar, we will have an unrecorded discussion where everyone in the audience will be upgraded to a panelist. Now, without further uh, um, delay, Stefano, the floor is yours. So we are looking forward to your presentation. All righty. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to present today. Um, today, I will talk about biodiversity risk. And this is a paper that we've recently written with uh, Teresa Kugler. And Jan Strobel and Shuran Zeng from NYU. So uh, let's get started. So um, as you have all kind of uh, noticed, there's been in finance a, a renewed interest or a new interest in understanding and managing uh, the relationship between economic activity and the health of our planet. And the kind of largest manifestation of this has been the work on climate finance that has bloomed over the last decade that tries to understand, you know, basically how does climate change affect uh, economic activity, but especially financial markets, but also what can financial markets do to help with the transition towards a sustainable economy. And uh, this paper tries to, uh, to um, put some focus on a related but different uh, issue, which is the risk of biodiversity loss. Uh, so in particular, what we do in this paper is we do a first attempt uh, at measuring the risks of biodiversity over time. So you think of it as aggregate biodiversity risk and in the, in the cross section, so across firms, across industries. And then we're gonna try to study, once we've measured these risks, we're trying to study uh, the effects of these risks, especially on economic activity, especially on, on, uh, on asset values. And we're gonna, we have a website that we started where you can find all the data and so hopefully we're going to basically our empirical analysis will be a little bit proof of concept and hopefully this can be expanded in the future by building on these measures. So let me start by saying, you know, what is biodiversity in the first place? Uh, you can think of it as the variety of genes of species and ecosystems in the world. And these are obviously a concept which is very, uh, you know, it really relates to the nat uh, natural environment, uh, but also as, as an important connection with the economy for reasons we'll discuss later, because you know uh, you humans uh, gain value from the ecosystem and from the fact that the ecosystem remains in balance and uh, suffers damages when the ecosystem gets out of balance or gets damaged and so there's been an estimate you know these are all kind of you know very wide uh, confidence bands because uh, it's difficult to to you know to to compute uh, monetary values for these damages but the losses of, of ecosystem services in the past decades have uh, have been estimated co to cause trillions of dollars of damages to the economy. What are the channels? I will go in detail in a, in a few minutes. In particular, if you think from the perspective of a firm, there are two types of um, biodiversity risks that it can affect the value of 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 a firm, uh, and therefore a, a direct or indirectly to the economy. Uh, we're gonna group them into two. We're gonna think about by uh, transition uh, physical risks and transition risks. So physical biodiversity risks, you can think of some example of the following. One is the fact that much of our economic activity actually does rely on raw materials that are, you know, that are produced by the ecosystems, for example, agricultural sector, uh, for example, you know, everything that, that is derived from wood relies on, uh, on having healthy forests that produce these woods and many other agricultural products, they rely on having a balance in the ecosystems. And so deforestation or habitat loss, they pose uh, potential damages to, to firms and to the economy. Uh, a second one, which I find particularly interesting, is the fact that actually 
uh, the pharmaceutical and biotech sectors actually rely on studying and using the natural diversity to learn about different, for example, compounds. And so it turns out that having the, the, the diversity of species uh, in nature actually plays an important role in the R&D process of, uh, of these sectors. And so losing that diversity means we have less to learn from, we have less uh, of these materials we can use for the production and the R&D and the production of uh, pharmaceutical products. And finally, uh, there is an interesting interaction, which I'm not gonna go too much into in this paper, but I think is an interesting uh, starting point for future work, is that basically uh, biodiversity loss interacts with climate change. So in particular, if you know the disruption of an ecosystem actually can make climate change worse, uh, for example, because it uh, leaves some areas more exposed to, for example, to erosion due to climate change, and vice versa, climate change can cause biodiversity loss. So these two risks are not the same. I'm going to try to make you to give you some example where they're not the same, but they're certainly related. These are in a, some examples of the physical risks that are coming from biodiversity uh, into the economy. And then there's all the related to transition risks because to the extent that we think that this biodiversity loss is, uh, is negative, uh, we, we expect governments to react. And they act in many ways to protect biodiversity. So they react, for example, in the ways you can use the land, uh, in the ways you use forests, in what the way you can you can uh, conduct your economic activity to uh, protect the some species. It it's also reflected in on the consumer side because consumers may want firms to uh, not use certain products, for example, because they can use uh, biodiversity loss. And then finally, there's reputational concerns like what happens we've seen in uh, with oil spills. Okay, so there's basically there's a very close parallel to the discussion we have in in uh, in uh, in the case of climate risk between, uh, with a distinction between physical risks and transition risks. So this paper has several parts. One of the parts you can think of it as a starting point is try to get the current perception of researcher market participants about biodiversity risk. Now, the reason why we focus on this is basically that in this paper, we don't focus on biodiversity as a kind of an abstract concept or a concept that is, you know, that is important uh, independently of their economic consequences. That may also be the case. There's, we, have, we might have ethical reasons to care about biodiversity on its own. But in this paper, we're going to care about biodiversity specifically because it's linked to the economy. Okay, So we're going to try to ask people that work in the economic system and financial system, what do they, what do they think about uh, biodiversity risk? Okay, So what we do is we run a survey of perception of biodiversity risk uh, among finance academics. Uh, public sector regulators and uh, professionals, so people who work in the industry. And just to get a perception of what people that are working with financial markets and the economy are perceiving about biodiversity risk. So what we do, we ask the question of, uh, you know, first of all, do you think that these risks are material? Biodiversity risk, either transitional risk or physical risk is material for, uh, for firms. Uh, and this is a, a, a quick, I'm not going to go into all the details of the, of the survey because we don't have a lot of time, but just to give you a sense of that, if you look at physical risk and you look at all our responses together, uh, about 70% of, uh, of these respondents, which are, by the way, they are academics at uh, top universities, they are policy economists from the Fed, the IMF and so on, and also alums from Stern and the SOM, the, so they work in, in, fine, in, in, in business. And um, basically, uh, you can see the 70% of these respondents perceive physical and transition biodiversity risk as being as having at least some moderate financial materiality for firms. And interestingly, the, the segment that is, seems to be most worried about biodiversity risk is uh, respondents from the private sector. Um, the other interesting answer to this survey that I want to, to report is we try to understand is the following. We try to understand what is the horizon that these respondents have in mind for when this biodiversity risk would materialize. And the interesting part here is that there's a pretty substantial part of this uh, pool of people that uh, of experts that uh, believes that uh, biodiversity risk is already important today, about 20%. And there's a substantial part that thinks actually that is going to uh, materialize within the next five years. So basically, especially if you look at transition risk, about half of the respondents, they perceive that transition risk is important, which will be important in the next five years. Okay, 
whereas uh, the physical risks are kind of more delayed in time, which I think makes sense. And uh, and it just it just gives us a sense that this is not a, a, a trivial risk that people don't think is uh, material. Okay, so the other thing that uh, I, I, you know, just this is just a few examples of why people say biodiversity risks are important to them. So here's an example of physical risk. It's uh, the, the respondent said, I, uh, I co-run investment fund in farmland and timberland, so which are obviously directly affected by these risks. And then there's an example of transition risk that says, you know, regulatory risk uh, related to biodiversity are important drivers of long-term uncertainty in the energy market for reasons that we're going to go into, uh, into later. Okay, so the part, the, this part of the paper is simply trying to document that people that work directly with production and the economy uh, are indeed worried about these risks and the way that affects their operations. Okay, so this next step of the paper is say, okay, can we start by giving a aggregate measure of biodiversity risk? And here we're going to operate by analogy to a lot of the work that we've been doing uh, with climate change, where we're trying, we, we, we used to try to measure a, a some measure of climate news or so climate risks. And here we're going to do the same for biodiversity risk. So the principle we're going to use actually mirrors very closely what we've been uh, doing in, in previous work on the climate, which is that just like climate risk, biodiversity risk is a slow moving process, right? You don't kind of have an extinction a mass extinction event in, 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 in a day or in a year. These are things that evolve over a very long time. And you know, for, for very simple reason, it's very hard for us to work with kind of very, very slow moving processes in order to understand, for example, how they affect us at prices. But it turns out that because prices should reflect expectations, we can actually work with these kind of very long-term risks if we get a measure of how the expectations are evolving over time. So even if we, you know, maybe the biodiversity risks are going to materialize most in 30 years, but day after day, we learn something about that. We learn if there is some, for example, some localized event, or we, we learn something about the evolution of the climate, which might affect, might affect um, biodiversity losses, or we might learn that, you know, you might take some steps, for example, to prevent biodiversity, uh, biodiversity loss. So in other words, even though this is a long-term process, there are high frequency news they are kind of up, they allow us to, to to track how the global you know the, the macroeconomic expectations of these risks are evolving, and that's what we're going to be trying to measure here. In particular, we're going to use uh, we're going to use two approaches. We're going to try to get a signed measure, so a measure that says there's good news versus bad news about biodiversity, and we're going to do that via uh, by studying New York Times articles, and then we're going to use a, we're, we're going to uh, construct a pure attention index, which is going to be unsigned. So whether people are talking about this or not uh, using uh, using Google searches. So uh, in particular, I'm going to get first to the New York Times article. Uh, the way we do it, the, the paper is all the details. Okay, I'm just going to be a little brief here. Uh, but we basically uh, start from the word biodiversity risk. And then we try to find words using some uh, simple machine learning algorithms, embedding algorithms to figure out words that are similar in meaning to biodiversity risk. And then we, the, we, in this way, we get basically a dictionary that contains terms related to biodiversity risk, like ecosystem, deforestation, habitat, and so on. And then we're going to uh, use this to identify which articles in New York Times every day are covering biodiversity risk. And then we're going to use BERT, which is a, um, a language model to basically um, to sign whether this is good, you know, there's good news or bad news, basically to, to extract the sentiment of the article. And this way, we basically are going to get an index which is built as the number of negative biodiversity articles minus the number of positive biodiversity articles, okay, from the New York Times in each day. So we're going to get a measure each day whether there's bad news or good news or net in the New York Times on that day. And the second will be the uh, Google Biodiversity Attention Index, which is uh, simply uh, reporting the Google search activity for terms like biodiversity loss or species loss. And here we're not going to assign it. So it's going to be basically, you know, whether, you know, the search is driven by good news or bad news, we're not going to distinguish. So we can think of this as a mere attention uh, index. And so just to give you an example, this is the time series of the news from the New York Times. You can see there are some spikes in these news. Uh, most of the spikes are uh, high, high means bad, okay? Uh, and why is because, you know, what, typically what we saw over, over the last decades is that there's been some events which have been typically bad for 
uh, biodiversity risk, but actually being also some good news. And you see these good news as, as downward spikes. Now, as a sort of a simple validation, we actually went to check that what happened during those days of the spikes actually is something that should be meaningful for biodiversity risk. And that's indeed the case. So you find, for example, spike when there was the, uh, the Gulf Coast uh, oil spill. Uh, there was a, a for example, uh, there was a weakening of the Endangered Species Act that Trump uh, did. And you, you see it here. You see the, the effects is the biggest spike. Uh, there are various reports from uh, some institutions that specialize in biodiversity risk. And when these reports come out, it's typically bad news. And you can see reflected in, the, in our measure. And then there was an, a, a, in, a, on, on, the, on the negative uh, spike here, there was a, uh, a law uh, uh, issued by Mexico that tried to uh, protect marine species. And you see that as good news about uh, biodiversity risk. OK, so this is one measure of aggregate biodiversity risk. And then. Uh, just to give you a sense, you would, you might wonder, okay, how different is this from um, from uh, a climate news? So what we did in this paper is we basically used the same exact methodology to also be the climate news index. And uh, so it's really the same procedure and the same data, but we're looking for basically climate terms as opposed to biodiversity terms. And you can see that there are some events like the California wildfires that make both spike. But there are also kind of climate specific events, and there are which are you know, sorry. This is the uh, the dotted line. Uh, for example, the withdrawal from the Kyoto Protocol is a climate event, but not a biodiversity loss event. And um, other events are in common, and other events are different. But the correlation is, is uh, ultimately pretty low; uh, is twenty uh, percent. Okay, and so this is all to say the biodiversity risk and climate risk are indeed different. Okay, in this paper we don't really study much the interaction yet. That's for for future work, but they are they are certainly distant. Okay, so that's my uh, that's my measure of aggregate risk. And then the next step is to think about the a cross sectional measure, so a measure of risk exposure. So how to think about this formally? We think of the aggregate risk as a risk aggregate series, right? The risk realization series. And so what we're trying to do here when we look at the cross section, we're trying to basically identify some sort of firm characteristics that we can interpret as firm's exposure to biodiversity risk. In an ideal world, if we got our measures of a risk exposures firm by firm correct, then you should then see that these firms that have high exposure with our measure should have also high beta with respect to that uh, biodiversity risk measure, okay? That's the validation we're going to do exposed. So both our aggregate time series and also our um, exposure measure are entirely text-based or or some other ways, but they're not based on any time series uh, correlations. But then we're going to do a validation. Validation where we're going to indeed check that those firms with high uh, biodiversity risk exposure measure according to these known time series met methods, they actually indeed have time series exposure to the to uh, the aggregate series. Okay. So how do we measure whether a firm is exposed to biodiversity risk or not? There are many different ways. We, uh, we take three approaches. The first one is a purely textual approach based on studying the firm's 10 case. The second is the survey I showed you at the beginning. In that survey, we also ask participants to rank industries by their exposure to biodiversity risk. So that's another measure. That's another way to, to think about who's more or less, more or less exposed to this risk. And finally, we're going to look at portfolio holdings of funds that specialize in uh, the focus on biodiversity protection. So let me go into the details of this. Okay, so first of all, the first three measures that we build are based on 10K statements. Okay, so you can see them here. There, there's a count score, there's a biodiversity negative score, and there's a biodiversity regulation score. Okay, so the idea is we're going to parse uh, the 10Ks. We're going to look for the same dictionary we used before. We're going to identify biodiversity-related sentences in the 10K. And we're going to say basically that any firm that mentions at least two, in at least two sentences, biodiversity risk is assigned a score of one. Okay, that's, that's, the count is again is an unsigned measure. Just say they're talking about biodiversity risk. The second measure is also trying to get to the sentiment of this. So it's going to try to see whether a firm is talking negatively about biodiversity or positively about biodiversity, because maybe there's some sort of business opportunity related to biodiversity. And then the last one is also adding terms like law, regulation, act, ESA, which is the Endangered Species Act, 
uh, and so on. So we're trying to get try to get to exposure to the transition side aspect of uh, biodiversity risk. Okay. So these are all pretty standard techniques that really we're using kind of the analog of what we do in the time series for the aggregate measure, but apply to the 10 case. That's just one measure, okay? We uh, we also try the survey-based measure. So in the survey that we ask these policymakers, academics, and industry participants, we ask to rank industries that are most affected by physical risk and by transition risk. Physical, obviously, by diversity risk and physical transition risk. And so we uh, we're gonna simply for every industry we're gonna aggregate you know how many of the respondents actually um, selected the industries particularly affected by the risk. So we're gonna get a ranking of industries, okay, based on the, these experts' perception of uh, biodiversity risk exposure. And finally, the the last uh, thing we tried about the biodiversity risk is we took four funds. You can find the names here that specifically say that they are targeting uh, biodiversity risk. In particular, trying to minimize the impact on biodiversity. And so the idea here is that any company that they, they would uh, overweight should be kind of doing well or protected from biodiversity risk. And any company that underweight would be particularly exposed to, uh, to biodiversity risk. And so we're simply gonna define the score for each industry as the weight in the portfolio minus the, so the weight in the market portfolio minus the weight of the industry portfolio. Okay, so we're basically gonna take the market as a benchmark and we're going to see the under overweighting related to the market all the different industries and we're going to use that to rank industries and so in the last uh in the last uh, part of this presentation what I'll show you is I will show you the relation between these cross-sectional measures and the aggregate measure so this is uh, a, a, over time a ten series of the average biodiversity risk exposure score in our data okay you can see that all the scores for whether it's the count score, so whether they talk about biodiversity risk in their 10 case, uh, where this is the regulation score and this is the one with negative sentiment. You can see that all these scores have trended up, uh, mostly driven by the, by the fact that these firms are talking more about the regulation. So the transition risk has been basically the driver of this growth in, uh, uh, in dimensions of biodiversity risk in, uh, in, the, uh, in the 10 case, okay? And this, I just want to give you some, some color about these different industries, okay? So what are the industries that seem to be most exposed to biodiversity risk? Where there's energy, there's utility, there's real estate. Now, of course, these, these rankings are relatively noisy. They're not, you know, they're not uh, incredibly stable. So there's some variation here, depending on how you, which measure you look at. But in general, you tend to find some uh, industries typically very much at the top and others very much at the bottom. So software and you know, saying conductors and communications, they tend, tend to be very low in the biodiversity risk exposure, but then energy utilities and real estate tend to be at the top. And here, just to give you some sense of why that's the case, okay? So for the energy sector, uh, why would they be exposed to biodiversity is because first of all, they could damage biodiversity via oil spills, which we've seen happen in the past, but also because they are doing drilling and they're disrupting habitats, for example, that's one. And of course, there's all this regulation in place to prevent them to do further damage to the, to the ecosystem. Okay, so that's for the energy sector. You know, uh, I, I'll come back to this because I think there's a nice example of the distinction between climate and biodiversity exposure. And then for utilities, you know, every utility in some way or another is exposed either to physical risk or regulatory. For example, water utilities, uh, they may be affecting the water, uh, the water environment. Okay, and so they, they may maybe have to be regulated so that they protect the environment. Um, many utilities, they, they operate directly in, uh, in, in, in a variety of, of uh, ecosystems. And so they need to, they are regulated also to protect, protect species and, and habitats. Uh, and, uh, and this is true for various types of utilities from the water to electricity to other utilities. And then real estate, uh, again, real estate is uses land and, uh, and there's, there's, there's a question of, of, of potential disruption of, of land, okay? Uh, for materials, well, ma the material sector actually is using some of the products or, or that are directly dependent on biodiversity, like forest, uh, like wood that comes from forests. And so they might be directly affected by the loss of these habitats in addition of, again, of the potential regulation for protection of these systems. Uh, and finally, I'm going to mention one more, which is the uh, pharmaceutical uh, sector, which is uh, that biodiversity is used 
for drug discovery because nature has had millions of years to evolve and figure out a lot of interesting combination of, of genes uh, to, to, to do all sorts of interesting things. And so we, you know, researchers in the pharma industry, they, uh, they, they learn from, from nature to, to, to produce some of these pharmaceutical products. And so damage to the, to the biodiversity can actually damage the drug discovery process. Okay, so I, I have more examples. So I'm gonna stop here with examples. And I'm just going to do one last thing, uh, which is I want to point out that the correlation between biodiversity risk and climate exposure is actually uh, not the same. And the nicest example of this is uh, is clean energy. Okay, so there's been actually some backlash to some clean energy, uh, like you know offshore turbines, for example, but also solar panels, because these, for example, both solar and 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 uh, and uh, turbines, wind turbines they actually use a lot of land, especially solar. And so they can actually affect the ecosystem. And there was, for example, there's an article here from the New York Times. They said that there were activists worried that offshore turbines would affect, for example, the whale population. It's just an example, but basically it's, it's also turns out, turns out to probably be false, but you know, there are certainly worries that, you know, even a firm that can continue positively to the climate transition can actually do a damage from the biodiversity perspective. And so the last thing I want to do is sort of a, to put everything together is a pricing exercise to, to basically check, you know, indeed, do markets price the biodiversity risk? And do we see that connection between the cross-sectional measure of biodiversity risk and the aggregate, uh, and the aggregate, um, the aggregate measure of biodiversity risk? And the way we put everything together is actually very simple. We sort portfolios based on these biodiversity risk scores, right? So we're going to have a, a portfolio that goes long, uh, long uh, firms that are low biodiversity risk and short firms that are uh, long, they are high in biodiversity risk. And then we're going to ask, this is a portfolio that we expect to do well if markets are pricing correctly uh, biodiversity risk, which is basically saying, the, you know, you can see the, the, the stocks of these companies, they have beta with respect to this climate risk. You would expect this long short portfolio to actually hedge our time series by diversity risk, which was be based on textual measure. Okay, so it's going to be a very simple edge next exercise, and the results are basically here. This is an out of sample hedging correlation. So we we'll sort this portfolio every month, and then we we'll say, looking forward, do we see that this portfolio does well? The price of this portfolio goes up in times where that measure the of biodiversity risk, uh, aggregate biodiversity risk spikes, basically. Okay. And so that's out of some correlation. You can see these are all our different portfolios sorted by the different measures that we have. You know, the ones based on the 10 case, the one based on the holdings of the funds, uh, the one based on the survey. You can see that these all these portfolios they indeed correlate out of sample with the realization of this aggregate biodiversity news. Okay, some correlate more, some correlate less. There's a caveat here that these correlations are all pretty low. Okay, from 10 to 20 percent. So it's difficult to hedge this risk. This is the same that we see in, in any basically attempt to do my climate hedging and also macro hedging. That's the kind of R squares that you get, okay? Um, but, uh, but still, you see a, a basically a positive correlation out of sample across the board. Uh, the last thing we do here is basically to say, okay, but is it true? Uh, the, is this something really, are we really capturing something specific to biodiversity or is it the case that maybe our biodiversity measures just line up with other things, other characteristics of the firms that happen to also spuriously correlate with this aggregate uh, risk, uh, risk measure? And so we did a bunch of approach to look at whether other characteristics, in other words, sorts by other standard firm characteristics, do they explain this out of sample correlation with this uh, aggregate risk index? And the answer is no. You can see that if you build edging portfolio using characteristics that don't include biodiversity, you get very, very low uh, correlation. Whereas when you use our biodiversity risk index, you get much higher uh, correlations. So this, we take this as saying, look, these biodiversity risk measures are actually capturing something which is truly specific about the biodiversity risk. And there is not kind of just re, uh, uh, repeating some information you already contain in other firm characteristics. Um, okay. And Finally, this biodiversity risk is a final way to check that this is not the same as climate risk. We show that our biodiversity risk hedging portfolio hedges biodiversity risk 
But as you can see here, it does not hedge climate risk, right? So all, we have different paper where we build climate risk for climate hedging portfolios, which are these green ones. They hedge climate risk well. The biodiversity risk index does not hedge climate risk well. Okay, so the biodiversity risk portfolio hedge portfolio hedges biodiversity risk. The climate risk hedging portfolio hedges climate risk, but the the cross hedging does not work. Um, okay, and I'm gonna close here. Okay, we did a bunch of additional exploration, but these are the main results. Uh, I'm gonna conclude because I think I'm exactly the half an hour. Uh, what do we do in this paper? We introduce measures of aggregate biodiversity risk. The, and also cross-sectional diversity ex risk exposure. And we studied the pricing in financial markets where we have pretty strong evidence that there's some amount of pricing in the equity market because indeed the price of these uh, affected industries are increasing value when aggregate biodiversity risk increases. And if you want to use the data, we have a website with all the most updated data available. And I'm very much looking forward to Karen's uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you so much for this fantastic talk. Um, Caroline is now discussing the paper. Thank you so much. Let me set it up. Et voila. Okay. So first of all, thank you so much for inviting me and for this opportunity to, to read and think about as well as discuss this very interesting study on biodiversity risk. Now, let me get started with kind of you know, providing a little bit broader context. I mean, Stefano has already done a fantastic job in this, um, but let me just, um, I, I think it cannot overemphasize the urgency and importance of addressing the biodiversity crisis, okay? Surprisingly, actually, the literature has paid very little attention to this, as Stefano also highlighted. And just to highlight this, you know, urgency and importance, um, let me provide a couple of examples. So several organizations in the past couple of years have um, highlighted this urgency and importance. For example, the WWF, it issued a code red alert for humanity, mentioning that the global population of several species has decreased by 70% since the 1970s. Relatedly, the UN highlights this, um, how deeply intertwined the climate and biodiversity crisis are. Essentially, in order to meet the Paris Agreement goals, there's absolutely no way around it but to address the biodiversity crisis. And the last example I'm gonna give is, again, the UN highlights that the biodiversity crisis really provides or represents an existential threat to the global economy, since over 50% of the world's GDP is dependent on nature and the services it provides, okay? So one would expect that the biodiversity crisis is likely to affect the financial markets in some important ways, but we don't know how it actually affects it, okay? And so this is precisely where this study comes in. So really, really very interesting, very important study that sheds light on, on uh, this relationship. All right, now let me um, get to the actual discussion. All right, now just to give you a, a summary. So what the authors do is they leverage textual analysis techniques to help understand how biodiversity risks affect uh, the equity prices. And um, as Stefano uh, mentioned, you know, they construct several measures of biodiversity risk. One is at the aggregate level, where they use the New York Times and construct a news-based measure of aggregate biodiversity risk. And they also construct firm level uh, measures using the firm's 10K statements to co construct again a biodiversity risk measure. Now they have several other variants and extensions of these measures. I'm not gonna talk about them now. Now, one thing to, to per, uh, perhaps highlight here is that all these measures really combine the physical biodiversity risk exposure together with the biodiversity footprint, which is often also you know, called kind of the transition risks. Um, now, what they find is that the uh, biodiversity risk indeed affects equity prices, and specifically what they find is that the returns of the portfolio sorted on the author's measures of biodiversity risk exposure co-vary positively with changes in the aggregate biodiversity risk. Now, um, you know, needless to say, there's a lot to like about this paper, okay? It's a very insightful contribution, and I hope to see many, many more studies that really look at this intersection between biodiversity and finance moving forward. Um, there's really an enormous, uh, not just financing gap, but also research gap. All right, now let me focus this discussion on four key carbons. Uh, the first one is related to the measurement. Then the second one, the biodiversity versus climate risks. 
Uh, the th third one, I'll, I'll discuss the disclosure of biodiversity information, the relevance of it for this study, and then a couple of additional points, kind of minor, te more technical points. All right. So in terms of the comment one, so this comment one pertains to the measurement. Um, um, as you could see from Stefano's presentation, the authors really put a lot of effort in constructing this text-based measure of biodiversity risk. Um, in my view, this is a very helpful approach, and I would like to give especially kudos to the authors for actually providing this data online and uh, uh, to the public, correct? So this is really a useful public good for the profession and kudos to you all. Now, the elephant in the room um, here is really the measurement of biodiversity risk. And this uh, comment, I have three sub comments and in the following, I'm gonna delve deeper into each one of them, but they are really all related to measurement, okay? So the first one is about the construction of biodiversity, the biodiversity dictionary. In my view, it's a little bit ad hoc, if I may say so. The second comment is that all the measures of biodiversity risk are indirect, not direct measures. And the last one um, it refers to the blending of these type of risks. So again, when you say kind of physical risks versus transition risks, it seems like these are all uh, both risk exposures. Um, but to some extent, one can say the transition risk is really the footprint of the company on biodiversity. So the impact of the company on biodiversity, where the other one is the exposure to biodiversity risk. All right, so let me let me just briefly uh, get into the details of each one of these sub comments here. So my comment uh, uh, 1A refers to the biodiversity dictionary, okay? Um, and so to give you a better sense of this dictionary, so it contains the following biodiversity related terms, Biodiversity, ecosystems, ecology, habitat, species, rainforest, deforestation, fauna, flora, <laughs> marine, tropical, freshwater, wetland, wildlife, coral, aquatic, desertification, carbon sinks, ecosphere, and biosphere. Now, what I would love to see is a little bit more information about how this dictionary is developed, how it is defined, and whether or not it was validated. And uh, in particular, um, one question that comes to mind is why are certain terms such as tropical and carbon sink included? Um, arguably to me, you know, carbon sink and tropical could just as well be climate related terms. And so this begs then the question, how much does this measure depend on the terms tropical and carbon sink? And relatedly, could it be that what you capture is actually a measure of climate change? as opposed to biodiversity loss, okay? Related to that comment, so in terms of which terms are included, another question is, why are certain terms excluded? And so here I'm thinking, for example, about genes, right? So this is also, this was mentioned by Stefan in his presentation, the genes are very important, especially, for example, uh, for, for the pharmaceutical companies, but we don't see it reflected in this uh, dictionary. And lastly, I think it would be, um, important and, and of interest to understand how does this definition, this dictionary align with others, for example, uh, the one by the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, the task force uh, on nature-related financial disclosures, this is a mouthful to say, so in the, in the, in the future I'm going to say TNFD, okay, and the Global Reporting Initiative, okay, and so this leads me to my first suggestion, I think it would be very helpful and valuable to the reader to provide a little bit more information about the development definition and validation of this dictionary, and for the long-term impact and relevance of the, me the measures, but also of the study's findings, I think it would be highly valuable to actually align the definition of biodiversity risks with existing uh, biodiversity uh, frameworks and definitions. Okay. Now, let me get to the second uh, sub-comment here, and this relates to the lack of direct measures. So in the study, um, the authors use several metrics, but all of them are indirect measures. Now, the good news is, there seem to be actually uh, more direct metrics out there that the authors could use. Now, when it comes to the biodiversity footprint, so for example, there's a recent study by Gerald, Romick, Soutner, and Wagner. So this is a working paper, very recent working paper. They use the data from Iceberg Data Lab that provides firm level 
data on the film's biodiversity footprint. And in terms of the physical biodiversity risk exposure, there is uh, the data provided by the uh, WWF's biodiversity risk filter, as well as um, the nature and biodiversity risk data by s and Global and UNEP. Okay, now I have absolutely no idea how good these or good or bad these data are, but I think um, they would certainly provide, you know, a useful benchmark, or at least it would be helpful to validate the text-based metrics with these uh, data, even if those data might only cover a certain uh, have limited coverage. So again, I don't know how good or bad these data really are. All right, so this is my suggestion 1B, ideally add proxies that directly measure firm's biodiversity footprint separately for the footprint, but also for the uh, for the exposure to physical biodiversity risks. And the last comment pertaining to the measurement relates to the blending of the measure. Okay, so um, at this moment, the authors blend the biodiversity footprint. So that means the impact of companies on biodiversity together with the physical biodiversity risk exposure, which is the impact of biodiversity on the company. To some extent, these are really fundamentally different concepts. And um, I think ideally these should not be mixed together, okay? But rather really sep separately measured because otherwise it's somewhat difficult to interpret in a sense of what do you actually measure? What do you capture and how to interpret the results? Um, and just to, you know, a, a little smell test here. If you look at this table, which um, Stefan also uh, presented in his presentation, you can see that the three top industries that are exposed, so most heavily exposed to biodiversity risks are energy utilities and real estate. Um, but when it comes to biodiversity risk exposure, you would expect that it is particularly agricultural, forestry, fisheries, and food and beverages that would be affected the most. Now, of course, this ranking, so the question then is, why is this not the case, correct? And my sense is it might have to do because of the blending of these measures, because um, also related to some of the other tables that uh, Stefano showed, if actually this measure primarily captures the biodiversity footprint of companies, then this ranking pretty much makes sense because it's basically the negative impact of these industries on biodiversity. Yet it has, to me, a different interpretation than if you say, oh, these industries are fundamental, you know, it's severely exposed to biodiversity risk, which rather kind of puts the industry as a victim of biodiversity risk as opposed to those actually who cause the biodiversity loss, correct? So again, I think it's, it would be really meaningful to actually separate these measures into bi physical biodiversity risk and the biodiversity footprint, meaning the transition risks. All right, so now let me get to the second comment. Let me just check how I'm doing on time. Okay, I need to speed up a little bit here. And so the second comment relates to the biodiversity versus climate risk. So, you know, as highlighted before, these two crises, the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis are really closely intertwined. And as such, you would expect the company's biodiversity footprint is closely intertwined with its carbon footprint. And relatedly, companies exposed to physical biodiversity risks are likely to uh, be closely intertwined with their climate risk exposure. Okay. Now from previous work, we know, for example, by Bolton and Kasper Sheik, we know that companies' carbon footprint affects stock returns since investors really demand uh, greater compensation for the exposure to car carbon risk, uh, carbon emission risk. Now, for this very reason, the authors are very carefully um, uh, distinguishing between climate risks and biodiversity risks, which is great. And what they find, and this is, uh, I find is really interesting, is they find a negative correlation between these two types of risks. Yet, to, so this is interesting, it is very interesting, but I think it needs a little bit more explanation because of this intertwinedness. So basically you would expect that this should be positively correlated, correct? And so to some extent, this is somewhat surprising, which makes it very interesting, but I think uh, we need a little bit more discussion here. Why do we see, observe a negative correlation? Um, could it potentially be that the interpretation is a little bit complicated because of, again, of this blending of the measures. Okay? So this leads me to suggestion two, 
I think it would really be interesting to delve a little bit deeper into this negative correlation between climate risks and biodiversity risks, especially because one would basically expect a positive correlation. Um, and again, I do think this is a very interesting and novel fact that is worth highlighting, uh, but it would really be nice to understand the why underlying this negative correlation. Let me get to comment three, which pertains to the disclosure of biodiversity information. So as you probably know, there have been quite substantial efforts going on in recent years uh, uh, in terms of voluntary disclosure of biodiversity related information. So you can see this uh, figure here. So the Kanmen Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, it informed uh, the TNFD, as well as several other initiatives and instruments, which in turn then informs EFRAG, IFRS, and GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative related to its biodiversity standard. Uh, in particular, I would actually like to highlight the role of the TNFD, so Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, which was founded in 2021 and released its first disclosure framework in 2022. Um, arguably, you would expect, so this TNFD, just for those who might be less familiar with it, it's very closely related to the TCFD, so the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. Uh, so in a sense, it's kind of the, the, the new kid on the block, or the newest kid, kid on the block is actually the social inequality uh, uh, disclosure. But anyway, so let me stick to the TNFD. So arguably, with the launch of this TNFD, one would expect that... Um, this um, this has substantial effect on not only the firms and investors, but also their discussions and their attention to biodiversity. Okay, and this leads me to the third suggestion. I um, arguably these disclosure efforts matter for the interpretation. Okay, so um, it could be I don't know, but I think it's worth a discussion, um, a little bit of discussion at least to understand are the changes over time a reflection of these improvements in disclosure related to biodiversity, or is it the companies are exposed to increasing biodiversity risk, or maybe it's both. But I think it would be really an, an interesting conversation, especially in light of what's going on in the real world with all these efforts about the disclosure of um, uh, related to the nature. And uh, this is a kind of an empirical uh, question here. I think it would be interesting to examine whether the results are actually stronger following these events. All right, now let me slowly wrap up and get to comment four. Okay, so these are kind of some miscellaneous points here, P uh, maybe a little bit more nerdy and more on the technical side. But the first one refers to the newspaper. So the, the authors use New York Times, which is well, obviously speaking, it's very reasonable to use the New York Times. Um, but I think it would really be interesting to also consider other newspapers, for example, the Wall Street Journal or other uh, uh, newspapers that might offer a more natural source, given that they are actually closer to business and economics. Okay, So, so this could just be a, a robustness test. Then uh, in terms of the reporting uh, of the sensitivity of the hedge portfolio to the innovations in aggregate, aggregate biodiversity risk, the authors report the correlations, but they don't report the confidence intervals. And I think here it would be uh, good to actually include the confidence intervals into the figures. And my last point con uh, pertains to the survey. So I find it really super, super, um, a wonderful idea to add qualitative survey-based information to this study. This is not something you see very often in finance-related or uh, finance studies, um, but I think this is really a fantastic thing that the, that the authors are doing, that they actually try to get qualitative evidence here. Now, one potential concern might be e that, um, that the survey population might have limited knowledge and expertise about biodiversity-related fiscal and transition risks. And so as a result, the survey might, you know, uh, there might be limited inform inf I can't pronounce that word, informativeness uh, of that survey. And so just some indications that this might be uh, the case. When you look at table four, you can see that, and this is actually also, the, so the authors are very transparent about this in the study, that there are, there's quite a substantial percentage, about 35% of the respondents, who indicate no opinion. Now, is this they don't have an opinion because they have absolutely no clue? 
or is it for some other reasons? Okay, but this is kind of it's it's a fairly, in my view, a fairly high percentage of of having no opinion. Um, especially when you consider the people who were asked, who always have an opinion usually. All right. And then um, relatedly then in table one, um, which is a very interesting question about what about the time horizon of when these risks would materialize. Um, you know, it could just be a wild guess. So this is me being a little bit sarcastic here. Okay, so take it with a grain of salt. But if I were to be sarcastic, one could say that, well, if I just had a wild guess, my best bet would be on this time frame, correct? Because it captures like 25 years, while other time windows are much shorter or kind of less likely to be the case in such a survey. Okay, so so in a sense of, um, I think here my suggestion would be, I would, I think it would be super to add in auxiliary analysis um, um, uh, a survey or the results that only considers the respondents with relevant expertise, or slash and to weigh the responses based on the level of expertise of these respondents in terms of biodiversity risks. And perhaps um, in the next iteration of the survey to consider using time frames, time windows that are somewhat similar in length uh, for this survey. All right, so these are all my remarks. So the discussion focused on four comments. And again, I just really want to mention there is a lot to like about this paper. Uh, I think it's a very insightful contribution, and I hope to see much more work in this space. And I do hope my comments were helpful. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for this fantastic discussion. While we are collecting questions from the audience, Stefano, you could take the opportunity to respond. Absolutely. So first of all, Arani, thank you so much for uh, for all the comments. There's so many of them. Uh, but I can try to address a few of them at least. And uh, so I think, you know, on the measurement side, uh, I think we can say more, but basically, you know, we try actually to not make a complete ad hoc choice of the dictionary. What we did is went to work to vec which is uh, an embedding uh, engine. And then we just searched for biodiversity and we looked at the words with the highest cosine similarity with biodiversity. So why did we pick those words? It's simply because of that. So we try actually not to kind of choose and pick the words. Maybe we should, we should have chosen picked, but uh, that's not what we did. But certainly I agree that we could do more kind of validation and cleaning of the dictionary. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's uh, you you correctly highlighted there is a, there's a relation with climate. So that's something we can certainly explore more. Um, now, there's a kind of very fundamental question you pose, whether you know we should be using these kind of more indirect measures, which are basically based on what the firms that said disclose as opposed to a direct measure by firm. We explored some data on the direct uh, on the direct exposure. For example, we looked at the uh, areas that are protected areas in the, you know, where firms are headquartered. We look at some other data sets, not the one that, uh, that Zach has used, but other data sets. We found the coverage to be pretty low. And I think that's kind of the problem. If you think about what happened in the climate literature, most of these ESG measures are like pretty noisy. I mean, if you go beyond, let's say, carbon disclosures, but then carbon disclosures come also from firms, right? So our idea was that, you know, this, what we get, for example, from the 10K, ultimately is what the firms disclose and ultimately is the, the source of all our data anyways. From It's not exactly true. It's not exactly like that. But, you know, the, the firms do know have a lot of information. And so our idea was to rely on what they disclose. I think this is complementary to having reasonably good data on more directly about what they're doing. But we had found when we started this project that these, these kind of seem to have more comprehensive coverage than alternatives. Um, lots of other interesting things, which I'm not going to comment on here now. Uh, the interaction with climate change is very interesting. The ranking of industry is very is, is kind of noisy. So you're right that you know maybe we can make many stories about why one industry should be higher or lower than we find. Those, those if you exclude the very top and the very bottom, they are, you know, they are um, they are uh, difficult to measure. I think they agree with you that in some sense, in an ideal world, we would really separate the the physical and the transition risk. I honestly think most of what we are capturing is transition risk, anyways, because that's what most of firms actually disclose in their ten Ks, right? Uh, you know, I just don't think we have very good data on the direct, truly direct physical. If you exclude for the pharma industry, because the pharma industry does disclose the direct risk to their production process or their R&D process, but if you exclude that, there's very little 
that is not uh, transitionary. But I should say, is it kind of umbrella of all this? This is kind of a proof of concept, right? It's not meant to be the final word in measuring all this. Is a, you know, it's an example of what you could be doing, and you can do many things different. So uh, absolutely. So there's a lot of robustness we should do, and some of the things we're gonna leave for others to improve on. Uh, but thanks a lot. This this was great. Great. While we're waiting for more questions, I have some. If I may ask them. Go ahead. Uh, so, you know, in asset pricing, we care about risk premia. Um, so I was wondering, you know, if you have any comments about what is the risk premium that you associate with it. But I'm actually happy you're not talking about it, given the very short time span that you have. It might be hard to make credible statements. Yeah. So I think there are two schools of thought that we learn from the climate finance literature. One is made of braver people and some of less brave people. The brave people, they have little time series and they make strong states about, about uh, risk premia. And the less brave people, they don't. And I'm the less brave people. So we, we took this stand going back for all our papers on climate finance that, you know, it's just very, very hard when you're in the middle of the transition. And, you know, we have very short time series to say anything about the risk premia, so we don't. That's the reason. The other comment that's, and I, Mariam, I will get to you in a second. <laughs> um, and that is also like a cheap shot because it doesn't only apply to what you are doing, but there's a question, are you really controlling for all the other sources of risk that we know? And I mean, I, you mentioned you run some lasso regression on a factor zoo, but you have very specific industries that seem to be the most affected. And within these industries, you might have very specific characteristics that could exactly explain what you have. That is some form of interaction effect, for example. And if you do a standard factor regression, you might not be able to capture it. So the question about, you know, more general functional forms and I mean, Absolutely. it's a comment I can make to any kind of paper in this literature, but yeah. um, it's just a hard question, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's a very valid question. I mean, we I don't think we kind of really push the envelope too much on this. Like I think we can do we can do more. The point here was so we do did a bunch of other analysis in the appendix where we for example, we just do pairwise correlations. Basically, we say, look, if you just do univariate sorts on a bunch of characteristics, you know, does anybody seem to correlate relatively strongly with this measure of or aggregate risk? Very few do, and we kind of argue once we adjust to the kind of the fact that you are doing many trials, you 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 can't say that. But you know, we didn't consider nonlinearities, we didn't consider interactions. Like, I think we can do more. There was kind of a minor, less central part of the paper, but we can do more about that. Mariam, I think. Your question will be the last one, and then we will have the um, open discussion that is unrecorded. Uh, so, okay, so my question is actually kind of a long one, so you can postpone, if you want, you can postpone it uh, to uh, answering to the uh, to after. But so here is the question. So given that you do relatively serious in the space of economics, at least, text analysis, and there is always this issue of causality, and you're not claiming causality at all, I mean, as far as I can hear from the talk, but Caroline mentioned this interesting point that some, in terms of correlations, some industries are causing the uh, the decline of biodiversity, and some are caused by the decline. So Absolutely. I was wondering if you can use anything about the text about the behavioral response of people in this industries to these sort of news so like if biodiversity goes up i don't know fishing changes this way but like uh housing changes this other way and use that it's again not le legit like causal uh, evidence but something about the response differential response of these different industries and i think it would be very very interesting given yes. that you're do already doing all of this text analysis yeah, it's very, I mean, I think at the ideal level, it's a very interesting question. I think on the implementation side, probably we need to, I, I suppose we'll need to maybe dig into the most important industries and see and try to quantify this, right? I wonder if there's any way we can say for the 10 case themselves in the evolution over time, maybe there's something we can say, maybe that they can say what the, how they responded, for example. Exactly, exactly. That would be great. Like through just the 10 case, that would be, I completely, I was going to the maybe, industry, but yeah. like, that would yeah, be really yeah, yeah. interesting. Okay, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So we have more questions and we will ask them in a minute, but I would like to use this opportunity to announce our next webinar one month from now on September 28th.
And we are excited to have Sandil from Chicago Booth as presenter and Sharad from Harvard as a discussant. Uh, please visit our website for more details. I also would like to thank both Stefan and Caroline for these fantastic talks. Um, we will give you a big round of virtual applause now. <laughs> and I would like to ask everyone to play, please stay in the Zoom room while we upgrade you to panelists and then we can continue this discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>